a quick review of what we did last week. We're reviewing the book of Daniel and why, according to Peter, do we need to review? Do you remember we went to um, Peter and Peter said, I'm going to res remind you of stuff you already know for what purpose? Established in what? In the present truth. So we go over and over things we already know. And why are we reviewing Daniel? We went to Revelation 10. What was it about Daniel? Yeah, but why are we reviewing? Why is Daniel so important to us according to Revelation 10? Yeah, it's a little book. It's unsealed. Who was the angel that came down in Revelation 10? No less a personage than Jesus Christ. And what did he command us to do? Two things. What was the first thing we're to do? Take. What did it mean to take it? Make it your own. It's yours. Make it your own and eat it. Assimilate it. Bring it into every aspect of your body and your life. And, and, and it's so important because it's the book of Daniel that defines us as a people. There's no other book in the Bible, no other truths in the Bible. When you study Daniel, it'll take you to everywhere in the Bible. But it's the book that defines us. If we um, go to Matthew chapter 3, not only us, but go to Matthew chapter 3. Because we represent God's people at the end of the world, at the end of modern Israel. But if we go to the people that were at the end of ancient Israel in Matthew 3, what were they told? Matthew 3 verse, well, let's look at verse 1. Matthew 3 verse 1 and 7. Alyssa? Sister, sorry. Okay, practice. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. And verse 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to him, said to them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Okay, we've, we've been dealing with these, thank you, verses quite a bit. And the generation of vipers, the seed of the serpent. But the question is asked them, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? What was the wrath was to come? Yeah, big voice. The destruction of Jerusalem. Who warned them? Who, who was warning them of the destruction of to, to come? Go to Daniel chapter 9. Well, actually, before you go there, I'm just going to tell you, it's Daniel. <laughs> Daniel's the one that warns them of the destruction to come. And he's warning who here? The Pharisees and the Sadducees, the leadership of Israel. But just go over to Luke chapter 3, 7. So Matthew 3, 7, Luke 3, 7, same passage really, but there's a slight difference. Go to Luke 3, 7. It's the prophecies of Daniel that um, foretold the destruction of Jerusalem. He was the one that warned them. And Luke 3, 7 says, uh, Sister Carol? <coughs> then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Again, but Luke doesn't just delineate the Pharisees and the Sadducees here. It includes everybody, doesn't it? Yeah, the multitude. Who warned them? Daniel warned them. And, um, and we know uh, Jesus said, Matthew 24, verses 15, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by the armies of Rome, whosoever readeth the book of Daniel, let him understand. Was he sort of suggesting that, you know, it's optional reading, but if you get around to it, just take a look at the book of Daniel. It might help you. you know, it, it wasn't just required. It, it, was, it was life or death that you understood Daniel. Because Daniel was fleeing, warning them to flee from the wrath to come. Whosoever readeth, let him understand, then flee to the mountains. 
So if you, if you go to, to um, and, and also go to Second Thessalonians, no, go, go to Daniel 9 now. Go to Daniel 9. Where does he f warn them? If we go to verse 24. Our sister Olivine, if you could read Daniel 9, 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sin and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Okay, thank you. So it's, God is telling the, his people, I'm giving you 70 weeks of probationary time, 490 years. And within that time, there are going to be seven things that are going to be fulfilled. And he lists them here. Uh, the transgression is going to be finished. Make an end of sins. Make reconciliation for iniquity. Bring in everlasting righteousness. And he's going to seal up the vision and the prophecy. That's two things. The vision and the prophecy is going to be sealed up. Have you got a marginal reference for prophecy? The prophet. I'm going to seal up the vision. The vision is the Hazon vision. It's the... The vision of Daniel 8 is going to be sealed up and the prophet Daniel is going to be sealed up when? At the end of the 490 years. So if Daniel's going to be sealed up at the end of 490 years, 70 weeks, then what must it have been before that? Unsealed. So we see that Daniel gets unsealed and sealed, unsealed and sealed, and then unsealed at the end of the world. So Daniel was unsealed in the time for the time of ancient, end of ancient Israel, just as it's unsealed for the people at the, at the um, end of modern Israel. And it's the same message for us. But, uh, the question, I don't understand that, because in the reform line of Christ, there was an increase of knowledge for the book of Daniel. It, it was unsealed, that's what I was saying. Why? At the end of the 400, when's the end of the 490? 34. It gets sealed. Yeah, but my, my, my question is, don't we say that the increase of knowledge in the timeline of Christ is an increase of knowledge about the book of Daniel, and therefore it was sealed before that time, and it gets unsealed after 34, and uh, in 34 again? Yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm not making myself clear. So Daniel was sealed, it got unsealed. John the Baptist is bringing them okay. an increase in knowledge. He's saying, who, who, who warned you? So they're getting an increase in knowledge. The book of Daniel is being unsealed for their time. Yep. They're being taken, the shepherds, yep. the wise men. What are they studying? I just understand. All the prophecies, but they're looking at Daniel. You were saying the whole centuries it was No, sorry. Unsealed. it was sealed and it's unsealed for that time. Then it's sealed up at the end of that time unsealed again so it gets sealed and unsealed but both the vision and the prophet get um, sealed up and um, go to um, so so what was the message was flee from the wrath to come okay probation is going to close and um, let's go to second Thessalonians chapter 2 We'll see another instance of this. Second Thessalonians. Uh, we all understand the Thessalonians had um, some misconceptions that Jesus was going to come again in their lifetime. And Paul in chapter 2 verse 3 says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, the second coming, shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of position, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? So what's Paul saying to the Thessalonians? Don't you remember we did the Daniel seminar? We worked our way through Daniel 11 because all he's doing here is paraphrasing Daniel 11 verses, I think it's 36 and 37. So I'm reminding you of stuff you already know. 
He's doing exactly the same thing as Peter does. So, um, you know, this is why we go over and over uh, Daniel. He's warning us to flee from the wrath to come. And um, he's doing a lot more than that. Let's go also, let's see what we've done so far. We're going through the four chapters that uh, delineate the rise and fall of kingdoms, the prophetic, um, his own vision. And we looked at Daniel 2 last time. Daniel 2, 7, 8 and 11 are all built on the principle of repeat and enlarge. And you can, can you remember some of the other biblical terms that describe repeat and enlarge? Line upon line. First Corinthians says, uh, chapter two, things. comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. And Daniel 12, four, many are gonna be running. To and fro. All same descriptions of the same method of Bible study. So that's what we're doing. We saw there's four kingdoms of Bible prophecy, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece and Rome, represented by four elements, gold, silver, brass, and really you could write copper for brass, and iron. And we saw that Rome um, was represented there in Daniel 2 in three phases, pagan, papal, and modern Rome. Can you remember, um, and of course then there was the fifth kingdom, which was the kingdom of heaven, which was likened unto a stone. So four kingdoms of this world and a heavenly kingdom. What was the characteristics of the metals as they um, went down through the image? There were two lessons we learnt from them. Does anybody remember? They decrease in value. They decrease in value at the same time? Increase in hardness, increase in hardness. yes. And, the, and what did the decreasing in value represent? The moral worth. Decrease in moral worth. And the hardness? The heart. Their hearts hardened as he went through the ages. And if we go back to our notes, if we go to the bottom of the page of your notes in the overview, when we got to the bottom of the, we're just going to read the highlighted words from 15MR 39.1. Sister White says, we have come to a time when God's sacred work is represented by the feet of the image in which the iron was mixed with the miry clay. So where do we find our sacred work? Within that time frame of the um, iron mixed with miry clay. And over the top of the next paragraph, she defines that iron and clay. The mingling of church craft and state craft is represented by the iron and clay. So we really need to understand what our sacred work is um, at the end of the world. Now, um, we looked at the miry clay and the rock, sorry, the iron, but there was a couple of things I missed out. Go to Psalm 40, verse one and two. Psalm 41 and two, we look at a couple of principles. Uh, Brother Bob? Okay. Psalm 40, verse, verse 1 and two. 2. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he climbed up to me, and he heard my cry. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my going. Thank you. So we saw in the feet, it's a combination of miry clay and iron. The miry clay represented what? Church craft. Now clay, uh, God uh, described his, uh, his people as a, a potter's vessel, as clay, as his church. But what did Peter tell us the mire, mire was? Filth. The, the pollutions of the world. We looked that up. It was the polluted world. So the Worldly pollutions have come into the church and made it miry or filthy. So here, what's happened to David? He's in a horrible pit and God has brought him out of that. He's brought him out of the miry clay and set his feet upon what? Yeah. So is the rock in the miry clay? In order to get on the rock, what do you got to do? You've got to come out of the polluted church. You can't have your um, goings established if you're in the miry clay. The rock is not in the miry clay. 
So that's, we just got to get our heads around that one. Okay, so um, it's a, I just want to tell you a, a, a quick story of what's going on at home. In 2013, our government, um, it, it, it put in action a, a royal commission. A royal commission is like a public investigation into um, institutionalised child sexual abuse. And it was only meant to uh, run for about six months, but it's still running. And it really was looking into how institutions like churches, schools, sport, sporting clubs have dealt with these problems. And either, you know, they have a problem in a church, so they shifted the pastor or the priest on, and they haven't dealt with these things. And, and it's been horrible, really horrible. But out of that Royal Commission came recommendations. And the recommendations were to um, put in guidelines for these uh, bodies and, and our church has taken all that on board. You have to, it's, it's law. The government has taken those recommendations and put them into law. And so you and, um, we brought in what's called um, safe places policy, which means you make your church or sporting club or um, whatever a safe place for children. So you put windows in doors. You don't leave one child alone with an adult, that kind of thing. You report stuff. And so our church... Uh, uh, developed this seven module course, an hour each, that everybody that has a position has to do. And if you want to hold a position in the church, you have to um, comply with this course. And at the end of the course, what the church did that no other body has required of their members is they want you to pledge that you will uphold the ethos of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So, um, and they're saying the government requires us to do that. Well, that's not, a, not quite true. The government requires your people to be... To safeguard. Yeah, to safeguard and to, and to put these things in practice. And they test you. They have undercover people that will walk into your church and, and walk, walk around and, and, and um, investigate. But you have to pledge. And so... What, what the, effectively they've done is they're using the power of the state to enforce morality on its members. What does that mean? That it's lost the power of the gospel. So this is why the church needs state. We can't have, we can, we can, we're powerless to have our people act morally because I tell you what, the stuff that came out of that commission, we're no different to any other church. We have the same type of people and we've passed them on the same way. We've dealt with them the same way the others have. Before camera, let know where you're from. Um, Australia, just in case you can't tell. <laughs> yeah, um, so, um, y you know, it, it's serious times. And what does it mean to uphold the ethos of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Anything you want it to mean. <laughs> We're still trying to rack our brains about what that means. But what, what it also is effectively doing is make sure that people that are in position are, yes, men. Yep, tick the box, do the course, whatever you say. Thinking people are stepping out of their positions. But can you see how the church actually needs the state? Under the pretext of something really good. Because when you don't want to sign, what do, you, what do they say you're saying? <sighs> you know, it gets a bit muddy. <sighs> it's all miry, yeah. So I just thought I'd share that with you. This is... You know, we, we think that the combination of church and state is kind of cut and dried. Yeah, Sabbath's going to come along and, yeah, we know what to do. But these issues are creeping in very subtly. And um, some, you, Cunning, don't, le let you, don't leave you feel, uh, looking too good. Okay, so, um, so that's a little bit about uh, Mamari Clay. I want you to, let's also go to 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 7. 1 Kings 6, 7. turning pages and not looking what I'm doing. And this is the building of Solomon's temple. And who are we up to? Sister Penny. Yeah. 
And the house, when it was in building, was built of stone, made ready before it was brought thither, so that there was neither hammer nor axe, nor any tool of iron heard in the house while it was in building. God's kingdom is the kingdom of stone, according to Daniel 2. What do we learn about the kingdom of stone from this verse? What won't it have? It's a bit more than noise, isn't it? What, what was making the noise? The tool. Tools of what? Iron. 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 What is iron? Statecraft. No tool of iron used to build God's kingdom. He does not need the power of the state to make men moral. Okay. So, and we looked at the stone kingdom. What was the principle we learned about the stone kingdom? What was the stone doing to the image? And who gets stoned in the Bible? Lawbreakers. And what did Jesus say about stoning? He that was out of sin cast the first stone, which tells us what about the stone kingdom? Yes, so it's, it's a perfect kingdom with perfect um, citizens. Uh, and do you remember, um, what was our theme? We're looking for themes for each chapter. So our theme for Daniel 2 was a king and a kingdom. You have to have both. And we saw when we looked at the stone kingdom that Jesus always identifies himself with his people. Okay, so um, let's move on and we're going to go to Daniel 7. Daniel 7. We're to expect a repeat and enlarge of all five kingdoms. And we'll read verses 1 to 3. Sister Susan? Oh, Daniel 7, 1 to 3. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and vision of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon a great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. Thank you. So we're not going to go through all these chapters, because remember, I'm reminding you of stuff you already know. <laughs> But let's, um, we're gonna, let's do a little bit of proof texting. Go to Numbers 34.6. What's the great sea? Numbers 34.6. Our system, Shamila, if you could look up Numbers 34.6. Uh, Luke, Joshua 23.4. Joshua 23.4. The western border, you shall even have the great sea for a border. This shall be your west border. So the border of Israel was the great sea on the west. So the great sea on the west is the Mediterranean Sea. Luke, Joshua 23, 4. Behold, I have divided unto you by lot these nations that remain to to be an inheritance for your tribes from Jordan with all the nations that I have cut off even unto the great sea westward. Okay, the great sea is westward. So there you, 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 you prove some, I'm going over a couple of these because they seem to get, have been lost. Um, sometimes we can know something so well that we actually don't know where to go to prove things. Okay, so he sees four winds striving on the great sea. What are the four winds? Jeremiah 49. 35 and 36, Jeremiah 49, 35 and 36, and Sister Shiquetta, Mark 13, 27, Mark 13, 27, Jeremiah 39, verse 49, 35 and 36, Brother Jason. Repeat. I'll repeat that text. Please. Jeremiah 49, 35 and 36. Thirty-five, thirty-six. Yeah. Thus said the Lord of hosts: Behold, I will break the bow of Elam, the chief of the Amite, 
and upon Elam, I will bring the four winds from the four corners of, the, of heaven, and I will scatter them towards all those winds, and there shall be no nation therein, outcasts of Elam shall not come. Thank you. So we've got a principle here. God breaks the nations, and this nation being referred to as Elam, and how does he break the nations? He brings winds. And how many are there? Four of them towards the four quarters of heaven. And just in case we don't know what the four quarters of heaven is, Shaquette is going to read Mark 13, 27. And then shall he send his angels and shall gather, them, gather together his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. Okay, so what's that telling us about the four winds? Yeah. So it's, you know, north, south, east and west, it's the whole earth. So even though we're situated around the great sea Mediterranean, we, we also know that it refers to the whole world. And he uses these winds to scatter them. If you go to Jeremiah 25, 31 to 33. Jeremiah 25, 31 to 33. Uh, Brother Jonathan. The Lord shall come even to the ends of the earth, for the Lord has a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh, and will give them that are wicked to the swords, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation, and a great whirlwind shall be raised up from the coasts of the earth. And this and the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end to, uh, of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered nor buried. They shall be dung upon the ground. Thank you. Now this is taking us right to the end of the world when all the nations will be overthrown. But the principle there is what's used. And it's a, a great whirlwind. God uses the winds to scatter and to bring the... And, and really, what the winds are is them just fighting amongst themselves. <laughs> because what are we told in Daniel chapter 7? What are, they, what are the winds doing? Striving. And what's striving? It's, it's striving for power, control, dominance. It's war, it's strife, it's revolution. And so this is what Daniel sees. He sees the four. And open book quiz. How are these four nations represented in Daniel chapter 7? Lion. Bear. Leopard. Indescribable beast. I'll put in beast just. Can't. And what's our theme? Our theme is really given us in those first two ver verses. These nations are striving. It's how these kingdoms conquer and rule. And how do they conquer and rule? <clears throat> how do they conquer and rule? What, what are they represented as? Animals. Wild animals. <clears throat> and I'm just going to write politics <laughs> to keep it short. What have they all got in common? Can we see anything about them that would um, <coughs> be similar to Daniel chapter 2? Anybody here got a pet lion? Right, what kind of animals are they? They're wild animals. But have you ever been to a circus? Do you see a lion in a circus? Yeah, you can tame a lion. You can tame a bear, but they're less predictable. Mm -hmm. Ever seen a leopard in a circus? Mm -hmm. No. And that beast, I don't think anybody can do anything with that beast. Yeah, <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, yes, yes, you <laughs> big cages. <laughs> okay, so they get increasingly untamable, more wild and more unpredictable. More, um, uh, more uh, persecuting. If you were going to die of any of them, which one would you rather kill you? Not one. I think, I'd, yeah, but if you had a choice, just, just for <laughs> argument's sake. The yeah. lion. 
lion. A lion, yeah. Go straight for the jugular. Brother Luke? Um, and isn't the leopard the one that gets you while not? Leopard gets you while you're sleeping. That's Greece. Very subtle. You don't, see, you don't hear a leopard coming. Bear, what's a bear known for? Cruelty. Cruelty, that bear knows there's food in your stomach. You get mauled to death. I'd rather go by a lion any day. <laughs> and that beast, what's the beast? Sister Antonisia. Revelation 11. Yes, but no. it, you drew him the other day. No, Revelation 13. A and it is a, a combination of all of them. Mm -hmm. Just put them all together. We had a very, very good um, artistic demonstration of that the other day. Okay, so the increase in ferocity and persecution. But let's notice, remember we're told with the feet that our sacred work is in those feet. So we need a repeat, which is Rome. We need a repeat and enlarge of the fourth kingdom. So let's have a look at verse 7. After this, I saw in the night visions and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. And it had great iron teeth. So this is Rome. What does it do? It devours and breaks in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it and it had ten horns. So this beast, um, remember if you flick back to Daniel 2 verse 40, the Iron Kingdom, Daniel 2 verse 40. The fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron for as much as the iron does what? And subdueth all things and as iron that? Shall it break in pieces and bru How many times did it break? And when you go to chapter 7, verse 7, what does it do? Devours, breaks, stamps. Okay, the three phases of Rome. But who in particular? Sorry, who, who does it... Who Pagan does it persecute? Pagan rule. Who, who does this beast persecute... Who does it break, devour and stamp? Residue. The residue. What's another word for residue? Remnant. The remnant. That's who it's after. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it and it had ten her horns. What does that word diverse mean? It doesn't mean just different. It is different, but it means it changes. It transitions. It, um, what's the other words? transforms, thank you, alters. It's the beast that changes because it has three phases. Okay, iron, iron, clay, iron, iron, clay, toes. Right, same here. It has three phases. Breaks, devours, stamps. So that diverse is more than just, it is different because it does change. It does um, alter, transform. It's the ultimate transformer. Oh, true. Yeah. Because in Revelation 13, he said it has the body of the leopard. Yes. Yeah. And they, they blend in, don't they? Which is the biggest part of the animal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Basically, it just needs to change. Sorry? Basically, it just the, the word diverse just mean, means to change. It changes, yeah. I think if you go to a Brown Driver Briggs, it says transform or get some other words as well. <coughs> Metamorph, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we need to watch that. Um, okay, what, what is pictured by these animals? Um, what, what does it bring to mind if you're confronted by these animals? What do these animals engender in man? Fear. They are to be feared. And, you know, you hear a lion roar at night or a bear coming upon you, any of those things. That's what it, they're meant to engender fear in man. All right. So what's the repeat in large in Daniel chapter 7 on the stone kingdom? Open book quiz. This is stuff you already know. What are we going to learn in Daniel chapter 7 that is a repeat and enlarge of the stone kingdom? Look in your book. What comes next? The investigative judgment. 
The investigative judgment is a repeat in a large of the stone kingdom. Tells us quite a few things. What's the prerequisite of belonging to the stone kingdom? What does the investigative judgment tell us? What gets opened? What's on the books? The investigative judgment tells me that everything I've ever said, ever done, ever thought, the th things, sins that I would have committed if I had had opportunity, are all on record. If all we had was Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, we're in a bad spot. Because I look at that and I think, well, how on earth am I going to belong to that? Okay. So these beasts engender what in man? What should this do? Fear. Fear God. Because judgment's coming. Okay. The way these uh, kingdoms operate, are they particular who they conquer, who they want to have um, belong to their kingdom? They conquer anybody, don't they? What are we learning about the investigative judgment about God's kingdom? He's quite selective, isn't he? <laughs> okay, he, he, he picks and chooses. It's, um, it's an exclusive kingdom. So it runs very differently. The politics of God's kingdom runs very differently to the politics of the kingdoms of this world. And it's interesting that Adventism... They understand Daniel 2. In fact, most Christ of Christianity understand Daniel 2 to a certain extent. And, and Daniel 7, you know, it's kind of easy peasy. When you get to Daniel 8, most of Christendom drops off and a lot of Adventism. And then don't even bother with Daniel 11. Don't even go there. But if all we've got is Daniel 2 and 7, we're, we're, we're hopeless. Right? So we, we need to move on because somewhere... I've got to know how I can belong to the stone kingdom. Are you saying this uh, judgment is the investigative judgment, meaning 1844? Yes, the books are opened. Okay, so... Um, let's g turn to your notes. On the back page... We'll read from Signs of the Times, July 31, 1901. God's law reaches the feelings and motives as well as the outward acts. It reveals the secrets of the heart, flashing light upon things before buried in darkness. God knows every thought, every purpose, every plan, every motive. The books of heaven record the sins that would have been committed had there been opportunity. God will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing. By his law, he measures the character of every man. As the artist transfers to the canvas the features of the face, so the features of each individual character are transferred to the books of heaven. God has a perfect photograph of every man's character, and this photograph he compares with his law. He reveals, he reveals to man the defects that mar his life and calls upon him to repent and turn from sin. So fear God, <laughs> because that's judgment. That's what the investigative judgment looks like. Okay, now remember um, our sacred work is the iron and the clay. So we need to learn more about the fourth beast. There's a couple of principles we want to look at. If we go look at verse 8. I considered the horns and behold there came up among them another little horn before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots and behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man and a mouth speaking great things. So we'll be dealing with those three horns when we get to Daniel 11. The mouth speaking great things. Uh, anybody got um, ideas on that? What the mouth speaking great things? What was the fourth beast known for? Blasphemy. Blasphemy. Yeah. But the eyes like the eyes of man. What are the eyes of man like? What does it mean to have eyes like the eyes of man? Proverbs 27.20. Proverbs 27.20, Sister Sarah. Proverbs 27.20. Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. And that really describes Rome to a T. <laughs> Because that's why it fell. It was never satisfied. It kept pushing and pushing the boundaries, right? Man's never satisfied. Um, 
Are we ever satisfied? Let's go to Psalm 1715. Sister Doreen, Psalm 1715. As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. Can we see two classes of people? Mm -hmm. What it means to belong to the stone kingdom? Mm -hmm. What do we want to see with our eyes? Mm -hmm. And we're never satisfied, are we? Mm -hmm. Until we see that image mm -hmm. in, in us. Mm -hmm. I will be satisfied when I awake with, our, the, with thy likeness. And so, who does Daniel represent? Us at the end of the world. Go back to Daniel 7. Daniel is God's people at the end of the world. And I, I just love this. Go to verse 15. Daniel seven fifteen. I, Daniel, he's had the vision, right? He's seen the four beasts and he's seen the investigative judgment. And then in verse 15, he says, I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near unto one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made me know the interpretation of the things. So Daniel wants to understand, right? The angel comes along and he's going to give him an understanding, right? What does the angel say? Verse 17. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. That's it. Would you be satisfied? Really? <laughs> That's all you're going to give me? So what does Daniel do? Verse 19, then I would know the truth of the four. He doesn't give up. He's not satisfied. Never satisfied. Tell me no. And he needs to know that fourth beast. Why? Because that fourth beast is the iron and the miry clay, which is our sacred work. And then you go to the end of Daniel 8. Remember Daniel 8, he has that wonderful vision where he sees the rise and fall of kingdoms. Then he hears the dialogue between Christ and Gabriel. Then Gabriel comes and gives him a Bible study. And in verse 27, he says, I didn't understand any of it. So what does he do in chapter nine? He studies. He's not satisfied. Not satisfied at all. You'd think you'd be satisfied after Daniel 8, wouldn't you, after all that? What happens at the end of Daniel 11 in Daniel 12? After all the explanation of Gabriel in Daniel chapter 11 and then into Daniel chapter 12, verse 8. And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And it's there where Gabriel says, go stand in your lot. <laughs> we're not, we, if we get to the point where we're satisfied with our understanding, we're in a very bad way. Okay? Where we're Daniels. Okay, that's, that's the later seen condition. So you've got people... With, um, at the end of the world, that their eyes are never satisfied representing um, the fourth beast and you've got um, God's people that are not satisfied until they wake with his likeness. Um, okay, so let's go to Daniel 8. Repeat and enlarge. And we'll read, maybe we'll read 1 to 3. And who are we up to? Sister Tess. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. And I saw in a vision, and it came to pass when I saw that I was at Shushan in the palace, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in a vision, and I was by the river Ulai. Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram which had two horns, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. And then go to, um, actually read four and five. I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward, so that no beasts might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. And as I was considering, behold, an he goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Thank you. So here we've got the same four kingdoms, and they're represented as what? Do we see Babylon? 
We actually do, but we're not going to get to that yet. Do we see Medo-Persia? Medo-Persia is the? Do we see Greece? Greece is the? And Rome? We haven't read up to that yet, but you know the story. Is the little horn. And again, we've got animals, but what kind of animals are these? Sacrificial animals. What is necessary to be a sacrificial animal? Unblemished. Unblemished. Okay. So right here now we've got our theme for Daniel chapter 8. It's about, um, well actually, well, we'll, we'll, do you know what it's about? It's religion, yes. But what kind of religion? False religion, counterfeit religion. So we need to um, understand how this counterfeit religion works. Then, in, in Australia, we've got these shops called NQR. They're not quite right shops. So things that are damaged, things that are nearly out of their expiry date, you go to NQR and you get a bargain. So we call these our NQR um, sacrificial animals. They're not quite right. We know that the ram has one horn higher than the other. The he goat has a horn where it shouldn't be and then breaks. And then we've got a little horn. Um... What's, what's the problem with these two animals, the ram and the he-goat, and the little horn, actually? Uh, can you see any similarities in those verses? That they, do they have anything in common? What does the ram do at the end of verse 4? Becomes? What about the he-goat? Very great. What about the little horn? Exceeding great. And Brother Luke, what does that... It's all the one word. What's the word? Gadal. Gadal. And it means what? The spirit of self-exaltation. So we can see that the reason why the animals are behaving the way they are is because their religion is becoming more and more self-exalting. What Daniel 8 is, it's, it's, it's comparing the philosophy of paganism with the theology of Hebrew, uh, of the Hebrews. And... Um, yeah. Okay. So... Um, we know that if you go to verse, verse 9, we see that the little horn waxes exceeding great. Verse 10, and it waxed great. That's even more, um, that this is referring to papal Rome. That, that's referring to like a candle that waxes over until it can burn no more. It's more, more, more gadal than exceeding great, so to speak. And verse 11, yea, he magnified himself. Same word as great. Um, so this, this is um, it's explained in one word in verse 11. What's the word in verse 11 that explains or describes this religion? Magnified, Magnified himself, yeah, but we're going to give a name to this religion. The daily. And the daily is? Paganism. And this is how paganism works. Uh, what, what's the other word for paganism? What does paganism mean? What, sorry, daily. Daily? The other word for daily? Continual. It's continual. It's the religion that's been around from the beginning. It's just getting worse and worse. It's becoming more and more self-exalting. And we know that as we look down through the kingdoms, uh, you know, Nebuchadnezzar exalted himself, but nothing like, um, uh, you know, Darius came up with the, the, well, his people came up with the, the laws of infallibility. By the time you get to um, Alexander the Great, he... Um, he thought he was a demigod. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the Caesars and the popes that actually think they're God on her earth. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting because why was Alexander the Great called the Great? He's pretty much called himself that. He wasn't that great. You want to have a fun Google? Google up Alexander the Not-So-Great because he wasn't that great. He got everything handed to him on his platter. It was his father that developed the army and the, and the military strategy 
and he never ruled anything. He just kept conquering. You know, he, he couldn't rule his body, so how could he rule a nation? He, there's, they, they list all the things that he wasn't so great about. I mean, he was a, he, you know, he did expand his empire very well, but they just become more self-exalting. So, um, what about the um, the horn? The little horn. What is this little horn? Go to Psalm 118, 27, because this is our sacred work. Psalm 118, 27. Oh. Where are we up to? Sister Antonisia. God is the Lord which hath shewed us light. Find the sacrifice with cords, even onto the altar, the horns of the altar. So this horn, this little horn, does it belong to an animal? What, what's the theme of, that, of chapter 8? Counterfeit sanctuary. Where Do we have horns in the sanctuary? What do you do with those horns? And what do you do with the animals before you put the blood on them? You brought your animal in and you tied them. You were tying that animal to its purpose. You were anchoring that sacrificial animal to its purpose. Then you killed it and you passed the blood. And what is the blood? The life of that animal was transferred into the sanctuary on the, on the horn. So what does that tell us about Rome, that, that um, little horn power? What sacrificial animals were tied to it? What sacrificial animals have we got there in Daniel chapter 8? I'm going to explain myself quite. So what happened to the ram and the he-goat? They're tied to the little horn. Their life is transferred. They're, they're Rome never invented anything. Rome took on all the religions and all the cultures of every, everything that it, it had conquered. So that's why you see in Rome, you see the Mithraism of... Um, sorry, Sister Anne. So basically, Rome becomes the sanctuary. Yeah, it's the pantheon. Mm -hmm. And all the life of all those, that's why it's continual. It's daily, just keep building up, building up. And that's why it's so self-exalting as it's taken on all those pagan religions that it's conquered. So, um, because, you know, that, that horn, that, that's, if you understand that principle, then you understand a little horn can never be Antiochus Epiphanes because Rome never came out of Greece. Rome's Rome, Greece is Greece, <laughs> right? But we're talking religion here. We're talking sanctuary. So the animals are brought in, tied to the horn, sacrificed, and the life is transferred. So you can get that concept. Um, and there are, actually, this is an interesting little study. Go to Psalm 75, verse 10. Psalm 75, verse 10. Where are we up to? Sister Pam? Mm -hmm. All the horns of the wicked also will I cut off, but the horns of the righteous shall be exalted. How many classes of horns are there? <laughs> Two classes of horns. So we've got righteous horns and wicked horns, haven't we? What makes them righteous or wicked? Go back to verse 4, Psalm 75, verse 4 and 5. Read that as well, Sister Pam. I said unto the fools, deal not foolishly, and to the wicked, lift not up the horn. Lift not up your horn on high, speak not with a stiff neck. What makes a horn wicked? Yeah, but what's it doing? Self-exaltation. All right. So it's self-exaltation that makes a horn um, wicked. And then it says in verse 6, For promotion cometh neither from the east nor the west nor from the south. That's another interesting study. Mm -hmm. So where does promotion come from then? It comes from the north. And who's the king of the north? true king of the north? God. All right. So um, some interesting concepts there associated with horns. And uh, we won't go there for time, but 1 Samuel 2, um, uh, is it um, Hannah, she talk, talks about Penina's horns. Um, all right. Why isn't Babylon mentioned? 
lots of reasons people give like, oh, well, the kingdom's just about to fall, but it hasn't actually just fallen. It's just changed. Yeah. So let's go to Daniel chapter 4. I propose because it's already been mentioned in quite an expansive way. Go to Daniel 4. And what's the story of Neb Daniel 4? You've yeah. So you, you know the story of Daniel 4. I'm just reminding you of stuff you already know. So let's go to verse 29. At the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honour of my majesty? What's he done? Self-exaltation. Who built Babylon? God. Nebuchadnezzar actually did. <laughs> he did build it. Yes, but God gave him it, didn't he? Yes, yeah. And so he, you've got the two principles of Babylon, Babylonian religion here. You've got works and self-glorification, which is the essence of paganism. And so what happens to him? While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee, and they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as a what? Brother Larry, you've got your brown driver Briggs open for Daniel 4 verse 32. Mm -hmm. What's this say for oxen? For oxen is... Bull, young bull, for sacrifice. A sacrificial bullock. Did he exalt himself? Yes, he did. So Babylon, and you can go to um, Daniel chapter 5, the spirit of self-exaltation there with Belshazzar. Of course, we know the difference between Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar was what? Both were rebuked for their self-exaltation, but... Sorry, brothers, left. Yes, yeah. And so Babylon is, is, is the bullock. It's the, the sacrificial um, beast. Um, and we might leave it there. Go back to Daniel chapter 7. So, what, okay, sorry, Daniel 8 we are, Daniel 8. So basically, I, and commentators will say this, is that God lays out the problem, then he gives you the solution. What we're saying is that solution is a repeat and enlarge of the stone kingdom. So what's the solution to the counterfeit religion of Daniel 8? Or what's the repeat and enlarge of the, what increase of information are we going to learn about the stone kingdom in Daniel chapter 8? What about the sanctuary? Cleansing. The cleansing of the sanctuary. <coughs> yes. The blotting out of sins. Yes. And there is a difference. Yes. Why do we need the blotting out of sins? That is when the sanctuary is really because everything's on record and somehow you and me have got to belong to this kingdom. right? Everything's repeat and enlarge. God is showing us what it re was required of us to... Or, or, well, we'll, let, well, let's look at it further, actually. Let's go to, um, let's go to Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Philippians 2, 3. We looked at this at camp. Philippians 2, 3 says, let, let nothing be done through what? Strife. That's Daniel 7. Or, and that's Daniel 8. 
Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the thing, things of others. Let this mind be in you. So let, you need to have this attitude, this thinking, which was also in Christ Jesus. What did he think? What was his attitude? What was his governing uh, prince? Yeah, uh, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of what? No reputation. No reputation. He emptied himself and took upon him the form of a slave and was made in the likeness of men. So we have the first step in his humiliation. What's the first step in his humiliation? Becoming man. God became man. Now we're going to see the second step in his humiliation. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. What's the second step? Becoming a sacrifice. Nebuchadnezzar, what, what was wrong about, um, what, what was counterfeit about, sorry, what was not quite right about this bullock? Who was the bullock? A man. So we've got half man, half beast, haven't we? Right? What is Jesus representing here? He's a man and he's also a sacrifice. Right? He's, the, he's a man and a sacrifice. It's, it's counterfeited. Um, and then, of course, it says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. And that's the principle. Before honour before honor is humility. And what paganism does is it counterfeits and switches it around. Um, okay. So the, we've got the two steps here. He's first man and then he takes that, that nature, that, that, um, that to the cross. Um, I'm, I, I don't, can you understand what I'm saying? Because I find it hard to put into words. The Nebuchadnezzar and Christ, are, it, it, like a, it's a, like a counterfeit. Mm -hmm. Yes, Nebuchadnezzar is king of kings. He was the king of kings, yes. Yeah. And Christ is king of kings. Yeah. So um, we really see the difference between true religion and false religion in those, those two men. Mm -hmm. Let's go to um, Hebrews chapter 2. And it was hard picking verses out of Hebrews to, to read this. To, to, um, yeah. But let's read Hebrews 2, 14 to 18. We're up to. Brother, could you read Hebrews 2, 14 to 18? As much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. And delivered them through fear of death, for all that were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Thank you. So, this he took on our nature. He took on flesh, verse 14. And, and took that to the cross, which has made him what in verse 17? Fits him to be what? A high priest. Okay, and let's read chapter 9, verse 11 to 14. What are we not to be satisfied until? We awake with his likeness, are we? Hebrews 9, 11 to 14. Sister Kathy. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, 
neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Okay. So this is um, a beautiful um, explanation of Christ's work as high priest. Um, what does he want to offer us as? Offer, sorry, verse 14. He offered himself without, so he was the unblemished sacrifice. That unblemished sacrifice purges our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So how do we serve the living God? Okay, Th think about he... Um, his, his humiliation to man and that taking that humiliation to the cross fitted him to be what? A high priest. And if we're not satisfied until we awake with his likeness, what are we going to see when we awake with his likeness? Who are we to become? Priest. What does it mean to be a priest? So we need to understand what it actually means to be a priest. We think, oh, we'll just join this movement and learn how to put a line on a whiteboard. That's not what it's about. <laughs> okay. And let's have a look at a couple of texts. Um, go to Exodus 19.6. Exodus 19.6. Uh, Sister Sue Ellen, Exodus 19.6. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation, these are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Thank you. So what's the stone kingdom? Uh, and let's go to 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. Brother Jim. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Thank you. Thank you. And we could have started in verse 5. The stone kingdom is the lively stones build up a spiritual house. That's your stone kingdom. You read through, you're familiar with these verses. A stone of stumbling in verse 8, a rock of offence, even to them which stumble at the words being disobedient. That's your image. <laughs> verse 10, which in time past were not a people. They weren't a people until they're hewn out of that mountain. They're not a people till they're the residue. But, uh, um, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So we really do need to understand what it means to be priests. If we go to the last quote here from evangelism, Pages 221-222. The subject of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment should be clearly understood by the people of God. All need a knowledge for themselves of the position and work of their great high priest. Otherwise, it will be impossible for them to exercise the faith, which is essential at this time, or to occupy the position which God designs them to fill. What's the position that God designs us to fill? In order to, for us to be priests, we better study the priest. Yeah. We need to know what the investigative judgment's about, what the cleansing of the sanctuary is about, what the blotting out of sin's about. And then we take all that knowledge to Daniel chapter 11, combine that with what we're going to learn in Daniel chapter 11, and then you've got your stone kingdom. Yeah. Every individual has a soul to save or to lose. Each has a case pending at the bar of God. Each must meet the great judge face to face. How important then that every mind contemplate often the solemn scene when the judgment shall sit and the books shall be opened, when with Daniel every individual must stand in his lot at the end of the days. 
All who have received the light upon these subjects are to bear testimony of the great truths which God has committed to them. The sanctuary in heaven is the very centre of Christ's work in behalf of men. It concerns every soul living upon the earth. It opens to view the plan of redemption, bringing us down to the very close of time and revealing the triumphant issue of the contest between righteousness and sin. It is of the utmost importance that all should thoroughly investigate these subjects and be able to give an answer to everyone that asketh them a reason of the hope that is in them. Okay. So, well, we'll let's, let's try and finish Daniel 11. We've got 15 minutes. Daniel 11. What's Daniel 11 about? Well, if we actually, if you go to Daniel 10, Daniel 10 verse 14 says, Gabriel's talking to Daniel, Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for the vision is yet for many days. So we know Daniel 11 is about what's going to befall God's people at the end of the world. Um, and then Daniel 11 verses 1 to 4 starts with what kingdom? Meda Persia, and Meda Persia, um, we, we're very familiar with these verses. There's um, four kings, they stir up all against who? Grisha, and then a mighty king shall stand up with Greece. And then what happens to Greece? It divides into four. Let's just do a little bit of geography. Okay, what's our great sea? The Mediterranean, it's on the west, isn't it? And Greece divides up into how many? And we've got our, king, uh, our north, south, east and west. And each of them has a king, don't they? So Alexander's kingdom divides up and everybody's happy, right? No. Are you happy being king of the west? What do you want to be? King of the whole bang lot. All right. So what are they going to do? Strive. Because that's all they all, they they know they're wild, untamable animals. So they're striving. So in that striving, he gets knocked out. He gets knocked out, and we're left with king of the north, king of the south, and we're God's people. Wax bang in the middle. First the literal, then the spiritual. The king of the now north is he happy? He wants to be king of everything. In order to be king of everything, who's he going to knock off? Who's in, the, who's in the way? God's people are always in the way, both literally and spiritually. And that's the story of Daniel chapter 11. Because if you're king of the north, why would you want the king of the south? Who's the king of the south? What's in Egypt? Why would you want Egypt? Riches. Big voices. All the riches of Africa gets brought up with, by those Ethiopian traders up into Egypt, gets dispersed across the world. Money. What else is in Egypt? Food. Bread basket of the world. That Nile Delta with its rich alluvial soils. You can feed an empire on that. You want Egypt. God's people are in the world. Uh, sorry, in the road. How do you get rid of God's people? Two ways. Yeah. Make an alliance with them or tread them down. Because there's always going to be a few troublemakers that aren't going to want an alliance. All right. So what happened at the beginning happens in the end. That's the story of the king of the um, of the um, king of the north uh, of Daniel chapter 11. But let's go. Why does God allow it? Go to Jeremiah chapter one. Jeremiah chapter one. And let's read um, a Sister, um, where are we? Jeremiah 1. We'll read 13 to 16. I've just had a... Um, Cheryl, sorry, Sister Cheryl, I know that. And the word of the Lord came unto me the second time, saying, What seest thou? And I said, I see a seething pot, and the face thereof is toward the north. Then the word, then the Lord, sorry, said unto me, Out of the north an evil shall break forth upon all the inhabitants of the land. For lo, I will call all the families of the kingdoms of the north, saith the Lord, and they shall come, and they shall set every 
won his throne at the entering of the gates of Jerusalem, and against all the walls thereof round about, and against all the cities of Judah. And I will utter my judgments against them, touching all their wickedness, who have forsaken me, and have burned incense unto the other gods, and worshipped the works of their own hands. Thank you. So, God says, um, I'm going to bring who? All the what? All the families. Who are the families of the north? We've got a Babylonian family, and a Medo-Persia family, and a Greece family, and a Rome. So who's Babylon in Daniel 11? King of the north. King of the north. King of the north. It's real easy. If you can understand Daniel 2, you can understand Daniel 11. They're all the king of the north. And why do they come? The original king of the north even though he's not mentioned in Daniel, I'll go like this and I'll go like this. He's there, but he's not there, so to speak. So um, what's the purpose of the king of the north? According to verse 16. Judgment on who? The wicked. What, who were the wicked? God's people. Because what are God's people doing? They're worshipping the works of their own hands. What did Nebuchadnezzar do? They're being pagan. They're being pagan. Their, their, their religion is paganism. So God's saying, you want paganism? I'll give you paganism. I'm going to send you the king of the north. The purpose of the king of the north is to bring judgment and chastisement on God's people for being choosing a different religion. Daniel 11 is all about purpose. That's the purpose of all these nations. God allows them not only just to bring judgment on God's people, but because there will be a remnant, a residue that will also show these nations true religion. Isn't that what Daniel and the three worthies did? Okay, so it's, it's almost symbiotic. This relationship between God's people and the kingdoms of the, of the world. Okay, and if you go over to Jeremiah 4, Jeremiah 4, verse 5, Declare ye in Judah and publish in Jerusalem and say, I'm sorry, Brother Nathan, could you read that? 5 to 7. <clears throat> Declare ye in Judah and publish in Jerusalem and say, Blow ye the trumpet in the land. Cry, gather together, and say, Assemble yourselves, and let us go into the defense cities. Set up the standard toward Zion. Retire, retire, stay not, for I will bring evil from the north, and a great destruction. The lion has come up from his thicket, and the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. He has gone forth from his place to make thy land desolate, and thy city shall be laid waste without an inhabitant. Thank you. So here that the... the um um, evil comes from the north. Destruction comes from the north. And the first um, beast that comes from the north in verse 7 is the lion, the, um, the uh, Babylon. And now go to Jeremiah 25. So God's people are worshipping the works of their own hands. They're pagan. They call themselves, they name themselves after God, but... In their worship, they're, they're self-exalting. So God just automatically, that's right. So does God automatically just send these nations? No. What does he do first? No. Through who? No. Somebody's going to warn them to flee from the wrath to come. So we won't read all this for time, but in Janu Jeremiah chapter 25, um, the word that comes to Jeremiah, if you go to... Verse 3, it says, From the thirteenth year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, even unto this day, that is the three and twentieth year, the word of the Lord hath come unto me, Jeremiah, and I have spoken unto you, rising early and speaking, but ye have not hearkened. Verse 4, And the Lord hath sent unto you all his, all his servants, so not just me, but everybody else, rising early and sending them, but ye have not hearken, nor inclined your ear to hear. So you're not listening. You're not even looking like you're listening. 
um, saying, verse 5, Turn ye again now every one from his evil ways and from the evil of your doings and dwell in the land that the Lord hath given unto you and to your fathers forever and ever. And go not after other gods to serve them and to worship them. Provoke me not to anger with the works of your hands and I will do you no hurt. hurt. Verse 7, And ye have not, three strikes are out. You have not listened, you have not listened, you have not listened. Therefore, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard my words. God's words came through the prophets. Behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. So who's God's servant? Who's God's servant? Cyrus Darius. Who's God's servant? Who's God's servant? All of them. They're all the families of the north and he sends them because they're not listening to the prophets. Okay, so... um, So what's the purpose of God's people? What's the repeat and enlarge of the stone kingdom given in Daniel 11? Sorry? Ten years. Number ten. Oh, okay. Yes. In Daniel chapter 11, we're going to learn more information. So, sorry? Yeah, but what's it? What are they doing? What's God's people doing? What's their purpose? They become the glory. This is the glorious holy mountain. Well, it becomes a glorious holy mountain. I guess, how, how is the stone going to become a mountain? What, ha- what has to be said? What has to be given? Tidings. That's their purpose. Whoops. That's their purpose. Okay, so we, we, we know the, um, the requirements to belong to the Stone Kingdom, but we know that our record <laughs> needs cleaning. Right? We know that God has provided, we have a high priest who is, ever liveth to make it intercession for us so that we can go about the business of what? Bringing people out of this system. Not only us, but all of them, so that it collapses. Um, I'm saying that we won't give them effectively unless we are. Want to go to Psalm 51? Go to Psalm 51. We won't read all this for time either. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Clear the record. Mm-hmm. Wipe them off. Wash me throughly from mine iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For my, I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. And you can read the whole psalm. Mm-hmm. Verse 9. Hide thy face from my sins. Blot out all mine iniquities. And you know verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit, a constant spirit. Constant. This, is, this religion is called the continual where to have a continual, a constant right spirit. And then um, cast me not away from thy presence. 12, restore to me the joy of thy salvation. Verse 13 says what? Then will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. There's a preparation needed to give that, those tidings of the east and the north effectively. We can write as many lines on a board as we like, but... There's a, that God is hewing stones, hewing them by the prophets um, to become part of his um, uh, um, kingdom. Okay, so what we haven't done yet, um, because we've run out of time, is what we want to do is look at the three phases of Rome because we put them on a line. And what those lines, the king of the north, the king of the, what are the three phases of Rome? Pagan, papal, papal, modern modern Rome. And what's the pattern? They have to conquer three geographical areas Mm -hmm. and rule the world for a time. time. And then they, pagan Rome, conquered who? The north to become the king of the north. Conquered Palestine, Mm -hmm. the glorious land, because they're in the road. Mm -hmm. And then it conquered Egypt. Egypt. Then it ruled the world for a? Time and then it fell. Papal Rome, those three horns had to be plucked up 
Mm -hmm. the, 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 the middle horn, the vandals, they were their allies. Mm -hmm. It's enemy, it's allies, it's victim. Then it ruled the world for how long? Time, times, and half a time. And then it? Modern Rome, Daniel 11, verse 40. Three geographical areas, the king of the south, glorious, glorious land, and Egypt, it's victim. And then it rules the world for? Short, Short space, not long. Then it falls. Revelation is the key that unlocks the book of Daniel. But this here, that's your keyhole. All of the book of Revelation fits into this. The seven churches, about there. Seven seals, same. Why does Rome fall? Trumpets. Okay, everything about Revelation fits into that keyhole. And it's all built on everything. I guess what we call this at home is we call this the big picture. <laughs> you know, yes, it's easy peasy, but sometimes you've got to stand back and see the big picture of what God's trying to do. Um, we were a homeschooling family, home churching family. So, you know, boring Sabbath, I shouldn't say Sabbath boring, but you know when the weather's bad, what do you do? You do jigsaw puzzles. And we had nice ones like of Noah's Ark and all that. But I tell you what, you get four people around the same coffee table doing the same jigsaw puzzle and what are you going to do? You fight over the box lid. <laughs> Could you imagine doing a jigsaw puzzle without the picture on the box? Right? You, the beauty's in the detail, but it's like, you know what? I know that sky, but is it the sky that goes over near the tree or is it the one that goes over near the mountain? You know what I mean? You, you, so sometimes you just need the big picture so that you can put the detail in and see what you're doing. Okay. Um, so we won't, we haven't really gone, but you, you get the gist here. We haven't done this in detail, but you get the gist. All right. Three geographical areas. And the tidings out of the east and north are what God is raising his people to do in order to bring down that image, to bring people out. But there's a preparation work that is exposed or, or spoken of in Daniel 8 that's to pre prepare us to give that message. Um, don't know if I've forgotten anything else, but we're out of time. So let's close. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, that you've given us the book of Daniel. And that you've given us Daniel the prophet as we look at him and we realize that he was never content. He never rested while there were things still to be learned. May we have the same attitude, but Father, that we will not be satisfied till we awake with your likeness. As we contemplate on our great high priest, on his condescension, on his humiliation, Lord, may we realize that the same is being required of us so that we may perform the work that you would have us to do. Um, that with, with the right motives, with the right understanding. Father, we want to be a part of your stone kingdom. And so we surrender ourselves to the hewing that you want to take place in our life, not only for us personally, but as a movement. We realize that there is still more um, chiseling and um, work to be done on us to fit us as stones. And we just thank you for that high calling, Lord, if there is still paganism in our hearts, reveal it to us that we may put it aside, that we will see the counterfeit and just want the true. Oh Lord, we want all of you and we thank you for wanting all of us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.